Hey guys, the video you're watching right now is a production from The Remnant Radio. You'll notice uh, uh, myself, Michael Roundtree, and Michael Miller are not the co-host of this program on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, we are covering church history. Here on Remnant Radio, we want to cover theology, church history, and the gifts of the Spirit. But none of us are patristic scholars, but we know some. Uh, in fact, the scholars that we interview frequently on church history, we have empowered to make weekly content here on Remnant Radio. So for the next 12 weeks, Josh Hoffert, Father Ron Drummond, and Matthew Escobar are going to be your guides through the early church fathers as they tackle this patristic period of history uh, that we are calling Back to the Fathers. And uh, speaking of Father Ron Drummond, he wears that clerical collar he every does. single week. And I think he needs something new. Yeah. We are he entirely crowdfunded. And if you donate to the Remnant Radio, perhaps we could afford to Another provide shirt. Father Ron Drummond with a new shirt. Solid. So uh, that is speaking of us being a crowdfunded ministry. We are. I want to invite you to uh, to contribute. If you've benefited in any way from Remnant Radio's content, uh, two ways that you can do that. You can click on the link for PayPal or Patreon. PayPal is for a one-time donation. Patreon is for a recurring donation once a month for as little as $5 a month. And we provide you with exclusive content that Josh and I come up with as well as uh, some of our other contributors. So I want to invite you guys to do that. Consider donating. And now stay tuned for Back to the Fathers. And I'm going to promise you, if you donate on Patreon, then maybe you can get Father Ron to send you an anointed collar, and that anointed collar may oh enable no. visions, streams, trances. Angelic visitations, demonic visitations, <laughs> liturgical <laughs> encounters, liturgical <laughs> visitations. <laughs> Liturgi Father Ron will visit you in a vision. We promise. <laughs> oh, my <Atlanta. laughs> uh, Everybody out there, <laughs> we like to have fun. Welcome to Back to the Fathers, and I'm excited about today's episode. And it's always awesome to be with uh, Matthew Esquivel and Father Ron Drummond. And, and in the background, of course, is the Remnant Radio team. And so so it's always great to spend time with them. And so we have an awesome, awesome episode uh, lined up today. Been able to go through some of Matt's notes as he's prepared some of this stuff. And I'm excited uh, for what we're going to go through. So make sure that um, right off the bat, you click like, you subscribe to the channel. If you're not, hit that notification bell and you'll know when we go live. Um, <coughs> and, you know, it's it's we're talking about important issues of the day through the lens of the day 1500 to 2000 years ago. And so for some reason, when we look at this stuff, uh, whether it's scripturally or um, historically, it's not like the human heart has ever really changed. And so the things that God did then, he does today. And what we can learn principally from them yesterday, we can employ today. Uh, I thought, um, I, I was reading uh, the other day in uh, some of Simeon, the new theologian, and he had this great prayer mm -hmm. as he's conversing. He's just expressing his heart to God. Um, and I just thought it was an appropriate thing to start off our episode with, given the content that we're going through. Uh, and he says this, how do I worship you within me? And how do I see you far away? How do I observe you in myself and see you in heaven? You alone know this. You who do these things and shine like the sun in my material heart, immaterially. And so that's just setting the stage for what we're going into today. And I'm going to turn it over to Father Ron to tell us, Ron, what do we got coming up? Well, we've got a lot of great content coming up. Some exciting shows uh, in store here in the next few weeks. Uh, starting next week, uh, we kind of enter into a new uh, series within the series on Back to the Fathers, where we're going to be talking about the church fathers and their thinking on Christ, on the person of Christ. And so next week, we've got a uh, another theological fight night, uh, Arius versus Athanasius, and what happens when Santa Claus gets angry enough to punch a heretic. <laughs> so oh, make sure uh, make sure to tune in for that. And uh, But this week, I'm really excited as well, because uh, we're going to be talking about visions, dreams, trances, angelic, and demonic visitations. Uh, these are things that people experience today. And uh, so today we're going to look at, at how are these things dealt with and looked at uh, by the church fathers. We're going to uh, examine, you know, what their practice and what their discernment was of these things. Uh, 
How did they advise individuals who experienced these things? How did they guide others in responding to them? Uh, ask the question, how is that helpful today for those who are pastoring or, or guiding others who experience these things? And uh, we're going to go about that by discussing and, and looking at some of the testimonies of Christians from the past, the second and third centuries, who experienced these things, dreams and visions and trances, etc., and we're also going to take a look at two particular uh, fathers of the early church, one from the West, uh, St. Augustine, and one from the East, St. Anthony. And so I'm really excited to hand this over to Matthew Esquivel, who is going to be leading the discussion today. So uh, Matthew, why don't you kick us off? All right. Thank you, Father Ron. Well, first of all, if you guys hear the sound of a vacuum cleaner in the background, it's actually a leaf blower. <laughs> I live on a third floor with no elevator, and I don't know how the leaf blower ended up right outside my window at 4 p.m. on Tuesday. But anyway, we'll just to clarify. Uh, to clarify, the, the, it's not a. It's not. It's not a vision of a leaf blower. It's an actual leaf. No, blower. no, there's an actual leaf blower in the yeah, flesh, oh, yes. um, right, okay. right outside my window. Anyway, we pray, Lord, that you would send him to you know the other side of the city. <laughs> um, That's called anyway, a transportation. What, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, we are going to talk about these types of cool experiences um, by cool, um, also biblical experience. I think they're cool. Um, they can get weird. Uh, visions, dreams, we've used the word trance, um, angelic and demonic visitations. Um, this kind of language is pretty common in charismatic churches uh, um, uh, 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 today, but um, we, um, uh, some of you may not be, uh, may not be part of your regular church or uh, vocabulary, something that's regularly talked about from the pulpit. So I just wanted to bring a little clarity there on what I mean by these terms, because we see we see these same terms used um, in the early church, uh, um, and um, and I want I I think that they have a basically I kind of want to give a basic um, interpretation of what they're how they're differentiating between these different types of experiences. Um, first of all, um, visions, um, pretty simple visions, just images that people see <laughs> while they're awake. Um, now these images can flash through, can uh, flash before someone's eyes, be an open eye, like a movie screen is playing in front of them. And it's just as real um, as, as you are looking at me right now on a screen. <laughs> um, or it can be with the eyes of the heart. It could be something in the mind or in the imagination. Um, it still can be uh, um, um, truly from God, but it's something that God impresses or imprints um, on the mind, on the imagination. It's not seen with the physical eyes, but it's seen with the eyes of the heart. You think of Ephesians 1, 17, um, that God would give us a spirit of wisdom and, and revelation and open the eyes of our understanding, um, that there's our understanding has, has eyes, so to speak, um, that God shines light and images into. Um, dreams and, are and simply, go ahead. Matt, Matt, just to just to yeah. before you go any further, just to clarify too that we're not talking about something that was um, happened in biblical times and then somehow disappeared for eighteen hundred or two thousand right. years, and now it's back right, again right, today. Right. We're you're right. looking at defining these from a biblical historical perspective. Um, exactly, because we're going to get it. We're going to get into all those things. But just so you know, we're not saying, well, these are the things that we have today that have not been existent for 2000 years. But these are the things Absolutely. we see happening time and time and time again. And we'll give many examples of of these things happening to people. So uh, just for people that go, oh, you know, they're talking about something new or fanciful. No, no, no. We're talking about something thoroughly historical. No. Right. Absolutely. Thank you, Josh. Right. And so. Um Dreams, again, are these same kinds of images that flash through um, our minds while we're asleep. Um, a trance, that's kind of the maybe the most weird or unfamiliar term. Um, trance, uh, other terms that are used for this uh, throughout these historical writings are rapture, um, a catching up um, is literally what that word means, or an ecstasy. Um, uh, 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 the Greek word ecstasis, that it is, it is a sort of an experience where the soul of the individual is caught up in some sort of out-of-body experience. You know, we see this with Paul. He says he has, he describes a man <laughs> um, that has this experience, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Um, and uh, Paul actually goes into a trance while praying in the temple 
Peter goes into a trance in the book of Acts while, uh, while he's waiting on his lunch. So um, I don't know, sometimes maybe he was just extra hungry or the Lord um, <laughs> knew he was ready for, for a visitation of a, of a picnic table full of unkosher food. So anyway, <laughs> that was Peter's yes. trance. <laughs> with, a, with a voice telling him to eat. <laughs> eat, eat, eat. Pick eat, it up and eat, eat. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, did you realize so, um, that all of Christianity hinged on someone's empty stomach? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So these trances, these happen while a person is awake. There's these ecstasies or these raptures, um, but their soul is clearly, quote, somewhere else. Um, and often, but not necessarily, that this experience, this kind of um, out-of-body experience is often accompanied by a vision, the voice of the Lord, the voice of an angel, or the, the voice of a departed saint. Um, so um, that's a trance or rapture, ecstasy, a visitation that's, it's really, these are similar terms here, but, but the way we'll, uh, um, we see these come up in history is that it's an apparition or image or illusion, um, some sort of image of a, of a spirit, it can be good, it can be evil, <laughs> that it, it appears to a person. And again, sometimes that could be um, seen with the bodily eyes or that could be seen with the, the eyes of their mind or their imagination. Um, and it's not something they're trying to conjure up, it's something that just suddenly appears to them. So, um, so vision, dreams, trance, visitations, some of these can be caused by God. Some can be caused by demons. <laughs> some can be caused by a person's flesh. And some can even be caused by mental illness of a sort. And the, the church fathers uh, mention all of these as a potential source of these types of experiences, which is the very reason why we need discernment. Um, the biggest, uh, uh, as we'll get to Abba Antony of Egypt later on, the biggest advice he gives to people that are having these kinds of experiences um, are, uh, he, he doesn't necessarily, he doesn't really advise people to ask for these experiences. There goes a leaf blower. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> literally right outside my window. Oh, my lanta. Um, Lord, we just pray this leaf blower vanish like those demons before Antony when he... Invoke the name of Jesus. Um, only although we're kind of we're kind of Jesus we're kind of enter <laughs> we're kind of entertained by um, by uh, Matt's uh, distractions. So oh my lanta. Anyway, um, where was oh so so Antony's advice wasn't primarily so much pray for these types of experiences, though he may not advise against that. His his it was kind of a given that people would experience this as they gave themselves to a life of prayer, of fasting, of holiness, um, offerings to the poor, and just um, and and uh, of solitude and contemplation. Um, he he just expected these types of experiences to happen. And so what he advised people to do was to pray for discernment. Discernment. Yeah. How do I make sense of these? How do I know if this is an angel that's appeared to me or a demon? How do I know if this vision I'm seeing in this out-of-body experience is truly from God? And what should I do if a demon appears? Like, how do I get rid of the guy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like nobody, demons are no fun. We, we want them out of our lives. Um, but um, so what do we do about that? So those are the types, types of things that Anthony spoke to. Um, we do, um, I'll briefly just kind of go through some testimonies that we see of these in, in the second um, and third centuries. They don't necessarily are giving a lot of advice in the, in the um, testimonies that I'm describing, but just to kind of give us an idea of what, why God might give us these kinds of experiences in the first place. Um, first of all, um, these, a vision, a dream, or a trance, or a visitation from an angel was very important in early martyr accounts. Um, as the church underwent persecutions in the second and third century, there are a number of narratives that we have today of, of martyrs that were, that, were, that were being killed. And, um, and one of them, one of the famous ones, the Passion of Perpetua and Felicitas, it records a number of visions and dreams that this young woman Perpetua is having. She's about 22 years old. She's a, a woman of noble birth, had recently converted to Christianity, and then a persecution breaks out, and she and her her Christian companions and her mentors are thrown into a coliseum full of wild beasts and warriors um, to be um, to battle to the death. And so Perpetua, um, the vision she's having, they are sustaining her in a time of persecution and suffering. So that's one reason why God may give this experience, to sustain and strengthen. 
you know, they were, she and her companions, they knew that she heard from the Lord. This was just a gifting she operated in, even in her early days in, in her walk with Jesus. Um, but they told her, ask the Lord if he's, if he's going to deliver us from this or if we're going to, if we're going to die in this Colosseum. And she sees a vision. She sees a vision of paradise and a, and a ladder going up to heaven. She sees her mentor go to the top first. And at the top in the, in that realm of, in that realm of paradise, she sees a company of martyrs. Um, and so, um, and she sees a snake at the bottom of the ladder and her mentor goes up to the top first and he's warning her, like, don't get bitten by this snake. But it was clear that she and her companions would all ascend this ladder step by step and go into paradise. For Perpetua, that was a sign, we're going to die. But God's going to be with us. That's really fascinating uh, mm -hmm. that you find this connected with the stories of the martyrs because uh, really the first story of a Christian martyr uh, in the New mm -hmm. Testament involves a, a vision of Jesus, right? Stephen th saw the risen Lord as he was being stoned to death, if memory serves. He's getting a lot of giant rocks thrown at him. He sees a vision of Jesus standing, and he boldly declares, I see Jesus at the right hand of the Father standing. And I mean, that makes him even more mad, um, his persecution. <laughs> so it, but it, yeah. it sustained him. And Stephen was able to declare over them, Father, do not hold this sin against them. And so not only did it sustain him to have courage to embrace the suffering, it sustained him to not die with offense in his heart towards his persecutors. Mm. You know, there's, and there's the, uh, the martyrdom of Polycarp as well, another, another right. early document, right, where he, Polycarp has a dream and in the dream, he's shown his eventual martyrdom, which gives him the strength to submit to the moment. And he knows that it's coming. He, the dream is basically his pillows on fire. He wakes up, realizes he's going to be burnt to the stake, which he is. And um, has that, I think, two days before his martyrdom. Um, you know, juxtaposing that, you're just making me think as you're talking about this, Matt, and uh, Father Ron, what you just mentioned, in studying the desert mothers, a number of the desert mothers come to come to their commitment to the life of solitude before Christ through um, ex visionary experiences. And uh, there's a, a great book out there that um, compiles a number of the stories of the Desert Mothers called Harlots of the Desert, because most of them came from a life of prostitution, uh, and then were taken into um, intense, intense solitude before Jesus and became quite influential. But you see these stories of them having visions of Jesus or hearing an audible voice call to them or, or something. There's one particular story of a, a desert mother named Pelagius, um, where she, or Pelagia, she went by Pelagius because she fooled everybody into thinking she was a man. Uh, Not to be and, confused with the... Augustine's antagonist, Pelagius. Yes, correct. no, that's right. Not to be confused. That's right. Yes, that's right. Not, uh, <laughs> not the enemy uh, of Pel grace. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Pelagia is her conversion happens at, as the catalyst of a dream a local bishop has, where a bird visits him while he's uh, a bird that's very dirty with soot and ashes visits him while he's preaching in this dream. He wakes up and he washes the bird off and he wakes up and next thing you, next thing you know, he's preaching that day and Pelagia comes in and he knows because of the dream that Pelagia has been sent to him and that she, she was a dancer in the city, a very famous dancer. Think mm -hmm. of some of your most mm -hmm. famous actresses that are known for their sex appeal. This was Pelagia. Mm -hmm. So it's scandalous that she walks into the church, but because he had the dream, he understands that, uh, God has called her, and she throws herself wow. at his feet, and he commits her to some of the care of the um, the deaconesses, and anyway, counsels right. her, and she ends up being a very influential desert mother. But the catalyst is uh, Bishop. The Bishop Nones is his name. His the dream that he had. Wow, wow, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, well, and we see we see similar um, purposes for these visions and dreams uh, in the writings of Tertullian of Carthage. He was a late second century, early third century writer um, that uh, was part of a, that eventually became associated with a very charismatic sect of Christianity in that century called the Montanist movement. His, the level of his affiliation with the Montanists is debated um, by scholars, but um, 
I think it's pretty clear that he, he was, he was uh, um, deeply connected with them at the end of his life. Anyway, there was a strong emphasis on, on the prophetic in this Montanist movement. And Tertullian of Carthage, you know, he's, he's writing about um, how some of these prophetic um, moments within the church service, they'd have their normal church service, and he writes about a particular woman that would get up and, 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 um, and prophesy in the assembly, and then, um, and then she, would, she would quietly step back, and then others would judge it, you know, and it would be submitted to the leadership of the church, which I thought was very interesting. Um, often some of these prophecies were giving people courage in the time of persecution. Um, again, we're in, we're in a time of, of, of sporadic persecutions of the church here in the second and, early, and, and third centuries here. And so, um, so it would be a corporate word to give courage and strength to martyrs and confessors, people that were being put on trial for their faith or that were being handed over to the authorities. And, just, and for people um, on whether or not they should, the people were fleeing. And so sometimes the prophetic word would come in and say, no, stay, I'm going to be with you. And some of you will be martyred, but it's gonna. I'm gonna be with you. It's gonna be okay. Um, which leads into uh, just another his uh, um, Cyprian of Carthage. He's he's later. He's a generation after Tertullian. He's the bishop of the of Carthage, which is the um, the main center of Western Africa, Western North Africa, Western part of North Africa during the third century. And so um, another persecution breaks out. A number, uh, uh, um, all of the Roman Empire is required to offer sacrifices to the emperor and to the local Roman and, um, and, and the Roman and the local gods of the region. They have to make a public sacrifice, get a certificate that proved it. Um, they got to get a basically a, some sort of passport <laughs> um, to, uh, to show that they have, mm. they have done what the government has commanded them to do. Um, I am making an obvious allusion here, but that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> <laughs> if you want my thoughts on that, you'll have to follow my personal YouTube. <laughs> so, <laughs> I do not represent the views of <laughs> Remnant Radio on here, but I do represent the views of Matthew Esquivel. Um, yeah, yeah. Wholeheartedly. <laughs> so anyway, so Cyprian, so all of these Christians go and, um, and offer the sacrifice and... Um, and get the certificate signed proving that they've sacrificed to these false gods. And so that was, that was basically, that was, border, that was considered blasphemy, apostasy, and borderline taking the mark of the beast. So um, the persecution starts to die down, and these guys that have sacrificed to these false gods come back knocking on the doors of the church. Hey, we'd like to take the Lord's Supper with you guys. Cyprian, his bishops, and his other uh, priests say, uh... We're gonna have to do some serious repentance before we just let you back in here. You just committed apostasy against Jesus. You've denied him publicly, um, and so you had a really strong, rigorous response that says these guys can't come back in. They've got to do be in sackcloth and ashes and fasting and prayer outside the doors of the church until they die. And may God have mercy on their souls. So that was the intense, rigorous position. But then you had the other side. Um, very lax, um, um, very emphasis on, you know what, God's a merciful, graceful God, let's just let him back in, without requiring any type of repentance or even public confession um, of sin for the um, apostasy that they committed. So Cyprian is trying to navigate here, how do we do this? Do we let these guys back in? Do we make them do repentance for life? And Cyprian is receiving, um, in his community, people start receiving visions and dreams warning of the judgment of God to say, if you just let these people back in without any fruits of repentance, the judgment of God is going to come on the church. And so Cyprian's got the fear of the Lord here on how he responds to this. Now, he takes a very biblical approach to how to deal with it, but he also appeals to these visions, and he says that young men and women are going in these raptures and ecstasies, warning us of divine judgment if we don't take this issue seriously. Um, wow. So visions and dreams in the early church were used to give direction on how to respond to church crisis. So Matthew, uh, this is in the, you know, the, the period of the persecution uh, where mm -hmm. the church is, is, is really just growing and, and, and surviving, but not spending a lot of time reflecting on these things. What about the period after uh, the age of the persecutions? 
Uh, mm -hmm. Do these visions and trances and do these experiences continue uh, once the church gets a little more settled uh, in relationship to the empire? That's a great question, Father Ron. Right. So, you know, in 325, um, um, you have the Council of Nicaea, you know, it's, it's the church in the early fourth century has come, has the Christianity has been legalized under Constantine in his rule. 325, you have the Council of Nicaea, things like that. And then 381, um, under Theodosius, you have Christianity is now the official religion of the Roman Empire. So now Christians, um, for the most part, are not being persecuted. Now, there's certain kind of smaller sects, uh, sects of Christianity <laughs> that are being <laughs> suppressed by the government. That word, whoever invented that word, you know, <laughs> a different word. <laughs> um but these, uh, um, so did, did the visions and dreams stop once the persecution stopped? The answer is no. Um, they are actually mm -hmm. very frequent. Um, and so much so that this is where we start getting a lot more of the pastoral reflection on how to make sense, how to discern what's going on in these visions and dreams. Um, because they would happen so frequently and people would do all kinds of things in response to a vision or dream that they had. Um, and that's where Augustine of Hippo and Abba Antony of Egypt, also known as the father of monasticism, where both of them come in. Um, so, wow, there's so much time we could spend <laughs> on this here, but, um, but I, I got to move us forward here. So Augustine of Hippo, we've talked about him. I've, uh, I've learned that not everyone that listens to this is quite the, <laughs> is, is the Augustine sympathizer. We got a lot of Pelagius symp sympathizers there, I realized, which, uh, which, hey, to each his own. But I love Augustine personally. Um, and we get, we get some insight from him on his own experiences um, and then how he starts pastoring these kinds of experiences in his community. In, um, in Confessions, um, this book here, which I highly recommend if you're going to read any type of ancient um, Christian text, you've got to pick up Confessions by Augustine. It's just, it's an absolute must. should be at the top of your list. Um, a lot of other things should be at the top as well, but this, I think, should probably be at least in the top five. Um, but in it, he describes this, this rapture, this ecstasy that he goes into. And so I want to talk a little bit about that first. Um, so um, Augustine, he comes, he gets converted to Christianity later in life. Um, his mom had been praying for him for years for him to be converted. And actually the Lord assures her of his conversion through a dream, which is so interesting. Um, his mom was a very devout, very devout Christian. And um, Augustine is literally running from his mother's attempts to get him converted. He actually um, tricks her and sails overseas overnight without her knowing about it because she kept pressuring him <laughs> to convert uh, to Christianity. Um, and so he said, mom, I'll be back in a couple of hours. And he is left the country. Um, but, um, but she eventually finds him. She crosses the sea, visits him in Italy and says, you know what, son, um, the Lord has given me a dream. I know you're really smart. You're really educated. You're, you teach in a, in a university, um, but you know, the Lord showed me a dream and he showed me that you're going to come into faith one day. And I mean, it just um, totally changed the way she prayed. It changed, the, it changed her prayer from a prayer of desperation and begging, which um, into a prayer of assurance, saying, Lord, I'm thanking you that my son is going to be saved. So it brought you assurance. Gotta, you've got to love those prayers. moms, man. You've got to oh love gosh, those moms. moms. I mean, moms yeah, seriously. Tears. Mm -hmm. What is it? I had a praying friend who prodigals. said that pray, praying, praying moms and praying grandmothers are the fourth and fifth members of the Trinity. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that might be crazy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, I love Mike Bickle. He always says when people are resist, when pastors or leaders are resistant to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, he says, pray for their wives, you know, because <laughs> their wives will get encountered by God and then their wives will pray for them. Um, I think there's much truth to that. Um, anyway, so Augustine has a really close relationship with his mom, and so he eventually does convert. Um, he His mom is the first person he goes and tells. He's, he's with a friend, um, but his he quickly goes to his mother, um, and she just rejoices, and he's um, eventually baptized. But, um, but he has this experience, this rapture, this ecstasy. Um, actually, both his mom go into this, he and his mom go into this trance together shortly before she dies. 
she becomes very ill. She's in bed. She's on her sick bed. Um, and both of them are, are um, looking out of a window and looking out into a garden. I see this beautiful garden scene. And they're, uh, they're um, talking about what etern- the eternal life of the saints looks like. What is it going to be like when we're in eternity with Jesus? And they're they're just they're talking and they're musing over over this subject, um, and um, while they start as they're talking about this, both of them are caught up into this ecstatic experience, where it says um, it says where they taste, as in his words, they taste of the eternal wisdom, who is not made. They taste of God, <laughs> in some sense. I love uh, this um, passage he has in Confessions. This is. Um, Confessions, Book 9, Section 10. He's saying, as they're talking about this eternal life of the saints, he says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor human heart conceived it. None has conceived what this eternal life of the saints would look like. Yet with the mouth of our hearts wide open, we panted thirstily for the celestial streams of your fountain, the fount of life, which is you that bedewed from it according to our present capacity, we might in our little measure think upon a thing so great. Yeah. And I'm going to read just just a few more. Go ahead. Well, I just love how thoroughly biblical that is. Like, I mean, he's just basically quoted three passages in scripture to make his whole, (laughs) to make his whole. So that, so my point being that the experience to him was not something that was divorced from the biblical narrative. It was right in line with the biblical narrative. And so he's quoting 1 Corinthians 2, obviously, um, when he talks about that first part of it. And then he's going to Psalm 42. And just like his language is so immersed in the biblical narrative. I love that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's real notable about this experience, I'll, I'll read on a few more lines here, but then leave you leave you to um, get the book and um, read, the, read it for yourself, is this language of longing, this language of reaching, this language of ascending. Um and that it, which goes back to that word rapture um, 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 from harpazo in the Greek, which means to be caught up. And so this is, uh, um, he says, our colloquy led us to the point where the pleasures of the body senses, however intense and in however brilliant a material light enjoyed, seemed unworthy, not merely of comparison, but even of remembrance beside the joy of that life. And we lifted ourselves in longing, yet more ardent toward that which is and step by step traversed all bodily creatures in heaven itself, when sun and moon and stars shed their light upon earth. Higher still we mounted by inward thought and wondering discourse on your works, and we arrived at the summit of our own minds. And this too we transcended, to touch that land of never-failing plenty, where you pasture Israel forever with the food of truth. Life there is, the wisdom through whom all things, all these things are made. I wow. love that. Mm. So this 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 stretching out, panting thirstily, lifting ourselves and longing, step by step traversed. It's it's touching the edge um, of eternity by the utmost leap of our hearts. And what he what he says later on, it leaves them sighing and, and even unsatisfied. Um, and he uses this language to um, to describe it that all other visions so far inferior be taken away from this experience that we just had. Any other vision, any other glimpse we might have. This taste of eternity that we're going to have. Um, he, he glimpsed it, but he's saying the fullness of this vision, which we're going to have it at the resurrection of Christ, every, it'll make every other vision or encounter seem totally inferior. He said, this sight alone ravish him who saw it and engulf him and hide him, kept for inward joy, so that this moment of knowledge, this passing moment that left us aching for more. <laughs> and so it, it leaves them aching and longing for even more. Um, so... So this you know, vision, Matt, go ahead, go ahead. Matt, right in, just to give a little historical clarity too, writing mm-hmm. a few hundred years later, Isaac the Syrian in two sentences sums up, you know, he's teaching more didactically than, than poetically as, as Anthony's mm-hmm. recounting a beautiful language. Uh, he says it's almost, a, it's almost identical in, in two or three sentences. So Isaac the Syrian says, in regards to someone having a trance or an ecstasy, as they'd call it in Desert Fathers, Mm -hmm. he says, his mind is always preoccupied as though he were speaking with someone in such a manner that he does not feel the natural physiological movements of his body. So just like 
you know, Augustine has said, you're, something transcends the, the physical, um, you know, something so overwhelms you, overcomes you. And he says, since his spiritual mind is found in high places concerned with the metaphysical contemplation of divine thoughts. Uh, so that's Absolutely. 300 years later or so writing about the nature of a trance um, using very, very si not similar language, but a s describing the same kind of experience. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, it's an ascent beyond the body and the mind as Augustine yeah. describes it. And it's a small foretaste of that eternal joy and that, that rest that we have at the resurrection when the Lord returns. Um, now, there are some effects that this, um, quote, rapture, ecstasy, or vision is commonly called the vision at Ostia, but it's, it's, um, he doesn't really describe anything he saw. He didn't see like trees and rivers and gardens. He, it's what he tasted in his soul, what something that went beyond even what you can imagine heaven being like. It, it, it wasn't a, I'm, I'm thinking about this and here's these pictures that flash through my mind. No, it was a taste of eternal life um, that transcended mind and body. But um, it left in Monica a, a, a detachment from worldly pleasures and a worldly hope. It, um, you know, Monica was extremely concerned about where her body would be buried. She wanted it. She wanted Augustine to take her her dead body back to her her hometown, have it buried next to her her late husband. Um, and she was very insistent upon this. But after this experience, you know, and Augustine was really worried about how am I going to get my mom back over there, um, ideally before she dies. But uh, Monica just said after that experience, she said, you know what. It does not matter where you're going to bury my body. Son, do not be troubled by this. I am about to pass into this eternal rest and this eternal joy that we have just tasted and experienced. Um, what now keeps me here? So um, she saw that and she said, son, I'm, I'm ready to go. Ready to be with the Lord. Um, um, five days after, she's bed stricken with a fever and a few days later, she dies very peacefully. Um, so what does this tell us? What does Augustine's experience tell us about the nature of these raptures, these ecstasies? Um, well, first of all, that these, um, that they're real, that they happen, <laughs> um, that they're for, that they, they're a foretaste of heaven in some sense, that they can transcend the body, the mind. Um, they might even have physiological effects. Um, it, it is, um, is, uh, um, Josh Hoffert just mentioned with Isaac the Syrian that sometimes that there it leaves the body in a type of frozen state. I mean, it's just um, it it you lose that some people lose the capacity to to move. They're just caught up in that moment of tasting heaven, um, and it can happen very unexpectedly. Um, in this instance, the the ecstasy happened while he and his mother were talking, were conversing about the saints in eternity. So they were they were setting their minds on things above. They were thinking on things that are noble and good and pure, um, and it and it ushered them into this encounter. They weren't trying to conjure it. They weren't saying, we're going to go up into a trance together right now. Right. They, were, they were just talking about these things, and the Holy Spirit caught them up into it. Um, and that's, that's and an so, important element of, of yeah. understanding these types of things is it's never something you try and forcefully create. Um, mm -hmm. It's never mm -hmm. something you try and enter into. Uh, like you had said earlier, it's, it's not that Augustine would have said, don't don't do this or Anthony would have said don't do this but it's not something that you you're not the catalyst for it God's the catalyst right. for it it happens to you Absolutely. as you seek him and and that's a really important distinction to make especially as we see because you see all kinds of you know contemporary literature talking about experience strange experiences and things like that you can get into the new age sphere you can get into right, uh, right other right. religious other other religious texts where people have experiences and one of the things that you see distinctly in the uh, way of Christianity is almost the passive, the passive uh, participation of the person in the moment, mm -hmm. because it's something that mm -hmm. God brings you into, not something that you usher in. Right, right, you right, know, Paul, right. John, John in Revelation, right? He says, "I looked, and then I saw a door, and I was invited in, and I went. It wasn't right, I, right, right, right. You know, I pictured a door and decided to walk through it. Right for and for Augustine, there is he does use the language of ascent." that we want to ascend in our minds and our thoughts as, as we're reflecting. I mean, that's why theology is important for Augustine. Yeah. It yeah. is a devotional, mental engagement with truths from Scripture 
that are causing our minds to ascend from things that we see and experience with our natural eyes to things that God has revealed to us through the scriptures, who he is, his character, his nature, his immutability, his impassibility, his eternity, the fact that he's uncreated, unbegotten, this, the Trinity, what is the, this triune unity? He writes an entire book on the Trinity. And this is, this is a way of ascending for Augustine. It's a theological exercise, but really it's a heart exercise and a mind exercise right. to lovingly and affectionately meditate on God. Um, and it, and in that sense, that's what ascending for Augustine. And, and, and ascending is we want to eventually go into eternal life when the Lord returns. But to, to Josh Hoffert's point, He's not using this to say, I want to try to conjure up um, some kind of experience. Um, yeah, you know, today we you... might say we, we, um, what, we cultivate an atmosphere where visions and trances happen. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm not saying that that can't be the case, but some of, those, some of that kind of language can be borderline. Um, and, you know, we're, we're I, you know, there's experience meetings where people go, well, we're going to take you out, everybody up into heaven and things like that. And right, you know, I'm really cautious about that kind of stuff. So I just want to be clear. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a mode of life where you're seeking God mm-hmm. and this stuff kind of tends to happen. And you know, it's even, yeah, you can yeah. almost you know, go check out our last week's episode that talked about the liturgy, which was thoroughly infused right. with scriptural meditation, right? Absolutely. Right. right, right yeah. Right. And, and I, uh, just to kind of throw a point in there related to all of this is that, uh, you know, you talk about cultivating a life in which these kinds of experiences can happen. And that was just the ordinary life of prayer and worship that these early fathers of the church lived in. Um, I think sometimes to today we create a dichotomy between like the ordinary means of grace and the extraordinary experiences like this. And we, we hope that maybe we'll have the extraordinary ones so that we can do away with the more mundane <laughs> yeah. and the ordinary. But it, it, it's, it's precisely their, the, you know, their, their faithfulness and their steadfastness in the ordinary means of prayer and worship. That constant uh, sub, you know, being submerged in, in the scriptures uh, and in the language of the Psalms and in prayer. Uh, Praying unceasingly, like we like we talked about, yeah, yeah. it created a receptivity to these kinds of things. The the kinds of blocks and obstacles that somebody not living that life might have uh, are cleared out of the way, and so God can get through in these extraordinary ways, uh, even though that's not what's being sought. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. And I think, and I I think it's important to say too that. These, this was a very holy moment for Augustine. Yeah. And it made him want more. Um, it made him want more of God, but just that it made him very grateful too. And I, I just think looking at him, looking at his experience, reading different um, people in church history, Teresa of Avila is another one of my favorites. It's, it's hard to have one of these experiences and to not want another one. Um, and to not think yeah. about what can I do, God, to offer myself more fervently to you. Um, now, yeah, Teresa of Avila was always, always clear. She, was, she's, she said her biggest prayer was not for more experiences. Her biggest prayer after these experiences was that she would not offend the Lord. It's like there was a sensitivity in her heart yeah. towards this is, this is my God, this is my friend. But at the same time, she loved prayer because of these experiences. Um, and so I think that's something important to keep in mind. I don't think yeah. the early fathers are just saying, you know, give yourself to the normal church disciplines. And if God happens to take you up into a trance, great. No, like these have a profound impact and these are invitations from God. And, and um, I think with Antony, we, we, we do see some instances that maybe a type of environment in your soul that might create the space for these kinds of experiences, but not in the sense of we're going to go on a trip to heaven today. Um, it's, right. it's the motivation is devotion to God and offering God a pure heart of love. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. So, um, 
Well, I had a little more on Augustine, but I think we need to get to Antony. But Augustine does talk about visions and dreams. Like, what do I do if, you know, if an angel appears to me or a martyr, or, you know, if a saint, you know, <laughs> appears to me, how do I know if it's from God? Um, he, he has a whole bit on that that we're not going to have time to. That his, his basic response for judging it is, um, well, if the... Um, if the angel or the martyr asks you to worship them, then it's not a good, it's not a good <laughs> angel and it's not God. You know? So um, he has a lot more to say than that, but that's, that's the main point I was going to drive today. Um, but I want to take us to Antony of Egypt um, so we can talk about him and then take any questions that are coming. Um, so Antony of yeah, Egypt. So put your questions in, put your questions. If you have any questions, put them in the comments and we'll get to them if we can. So I bear mm-hmm. saying, I don't think we said that yet. So feel free to ask right, questions. Right, right. Yeah. Please comment, ask questions. Here. Yeah. Um, so Antony of Egypt, he's earlier than Augustine. He's a, he's a generation, um, ahead of Augustine late or mid, mid third century. Actually. Wow. His, he, he lived a long life, but, um, into the fourth century. And so, and it was actually reading the life, the, biography of Antony that really that was very instrumental in Augustine's conversion um, so um, so Antony is an Eastern father um, he's known as the father of monasticism he lived in a day when there really weren't a lot of monasteries around and so he went into um, but many were inspired by Antony to start um, monastic communities after they met him and saw the fruit of his life um, individual monks um, that and then and monastery leaders would come to Antony for instruction on the ascetic life, the life of prayer, of fasting, of holiness. Um, and so Antony, he goes into the wilderness to be with God in solitude, leave the city. He, um, 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 There's a whole story there into that and why he does that, but we're just going to jump into this here. And in while in that time of solitude, he prays, he fasts, he sings psalms, he um, sighs daily, he says. Uh, this is this is in, uh, in the life of... Um, chapter 45, it says, he sighed daily, reflecting on the dwellings in heaven, both longing for these and contemplating the ephemeral, the ephemeral life of human beings. Um, so Anthony, Anthony, I guess it is worth saying this. He, he, he had some money. Um, his, both of his parents died young. He was left with his, um, at 18 years old, both of his parents died. He was left with his younger sister. Um, he hears a scripture passage in church one day uh, to give everything, sell your possession, give everything to the poor. So over time, he he gets rid of all of his possessions. He commits his sister to um, to some noble Christian women to care for and look after, and he goes into the into solitude. So he's just totally given every, all of this money and all of his money and possessions away. Goes into the wilderness and he's reflecting on the dwellings of heaven. I mean, that's, that's a, again is 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 he is he trying to you know, get into a trance. No, he's trying to think on things that are noble, that are good, that are praiseworthy. Yeah. Um, and he's contemplating the, the temporality of this life. So um, in, in his life, which you can pick up, the Western or classics of Western spirituality um, has a translation um, um, that you can check out. Um, and it's, it's written by Athanasius, who we'll talk about next week. Um, um, and um, he... Uh, Athanasius was very instrumental in the Council of Nicaea in combating Arianism, and so Athanasius knew Abba Antony and wrote wrote this biography of him. But um, he writes in this biogra- biography a number of demonic encounters <laughs> that Antony has while in the wilderness. Um, demons, quite, to quite a few, him. actually. Yeah, Te- yeah, quite a few. Yeah. I mean, he's like poor guy. He's just trying to go to a mountain I know. and pray, and there's a demon at the door. You know, it's like if it, it was it was a it's common like experience. Like a leaf blower guy, you know, at my window. Yeah, we're trying true. to talk about God. When <laughs> but anyway. when people came to visit him, when people came to visit him, they would they would hear him battling the demons. It yeah. was so common. It's just like I mean, it's, I it's pretty <laughs> jarring when you read it. Honestly, you're like yeah. You're like, wow, I'm not sure I want to do that. But um, uh, <laughs> you can see why people were reading. inspired, though. Keep reading is, is all I have to say. You know, get through all the, it's, the demonic encounters. Well, one of the things so, I um, love about one of the things I love about that one, just just briefly, is it says um, when he comes out of his solitude, twenty years of solitude, that he was known as spirit born, B O R N E, as he's born about by the spirit everywhere he goes. Mm-hmm, yeah, and mm-hmm, you know, so he's just he's such a respect for. Um, the way that he lived his life, the people that saw him. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's actually through these these demonic visitations, to get back to our vocabulary here, yeah. these, um, that he learns to not be afraid of demons, and he learns how to overcome them. 
Um, he learns to discern when a visitation is from God or from an angel and when it's from the devil um, and how to respond to it. Um, he came out of this time in the wilderness. He, he, went, he um, would go in extreme solitude for a long time and then kind of come out once in a while, talk to a few people, and then go back into solitude. Uh, but he would come out, he'd preach powerfully, he healed many people, he cast demons out of lots of people, um, and he, 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 he would instruct the monks on how to discern spirits on how to discern what's going on, these types of visions and visitations. Um, he says in the life, uh, Athanasius records in the, in the life, some instruction that Anthony gave to the monks, um, how to discern when, it is, when the spirit that visits you, whether it's a good one or a bad one. <laughs> really good advice. Um, when, it's, when it's a good spirit, he says, um, when it's one of the saints, when it's one of the holy ones, he says that um, the soul is not subject to disturbance. Um, the, the vision comes with tranquility, gentleness, that immediately joy and delight and courage enter the soul upon this experience. For the Lord who is our joy, the power of God the Father accompanies them. And the thoughts of the soul remain untroubled and calm, so that shining brightly, it sees those who appear by its own light. The soul is overcome by a desire for, design, for divine and future realities, and it desires to be entirely united with these things, if only it could depart in their company. So this is a good vision. It's from God or from a good spirit, an angel. If it, if it has tranquility, gentleness, joy, delight, courage, if, if the soul starts desiring divine and future realities um, after. Um, now he's saying... Uh, some people do experience fear when an angelic being comes and visits them, just like happened many times in the Bible. Um, they would tremble, but at the same time in the Bible, the angels would always say, fear not. Do not right. be afraid. Um, and so if it's a good spirit, it will um, help dissolve that fear, um, and it will transform that fear into joy, he says. And so, um, but why do we have these visions? He says, well, sometimes they give us strength and comfort in trials. They frequently take place, he says, in chapter 66, as an assuagement of the trials. <laughs> as <a wadgement laughs> of the trials. Um, they, they comfort. They strengthen people in the midst of, of, of any trial that they're going through. Um, a bad vision, uh, if it's a demon, how you know it's a demon? If it's troubling. Um, he mentions that at times it's accompanied by a crashing noise. Um, he says, troubling with crashing and noise and shouting, some sort of disturbance one might expect from tough youths and robbers. From this come immediately terror of soul, confusion and disorder of thoughts, dejection, enmity towards ascetics, listlessness, grief, memory of relatives, fear of death. Um, now, memory of relatives is kind of odd there. It's, it's, I think it's talking about when you embrace this life of solitude and you go into prayer and you just, you're trying to pray and engage with God, but all you're thinking about is how much you miss your family. Um, and if the spirit appears to you and you start, um, start thinking of those things, I'm like, wow, I really want to stop praying and giving my life to the Lord. And, you know, I really miss so-and-so that's, that's, that's kind of what he's getting at right there. But, um, and, and Matt, just a, a an aside on that, uh, mm -hmm. I've seen that happen a number of times doing outreaches in festivals and things like that, where you're interpreting dreams for people and asking them is, is mm -hmm. they'll have those kind of experiences so that very much so rings true with people's experiences now is they'll lose a loved one. Um, you know, they're not going into solitude, of course, but maybe their husband has passed away or wife has passed away or a parent or something. And, and they'll have a distinct sense of familiarity of that person. They'll have a dream where that person visits them. And they're so convinced that that person's with them that it becomes a sense of comfort. I've seen it happen a number of times mm -hmm. in, in right. a non-Christian sphere. You know, these are people that have just had some right. experiences in... You know, I just feel his presence around me or I feel their presence around me. And and you try and have a conversation that says that's, you know, you might not want to do that. And people are so attached to it. It's very difficult to get them away from that. So I can totally understand Anthony giving that kind of uh, advice. Like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe shy away from this. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And it, it, hatred and of other ascetics. So it's like they get you to start getting mad at people that are giving them li their themselves to life of prayer, of fasting, of holiness. Yeah. Um, and the, the glaring way to discern that this is a demon is if they say, fall down and worship me. I mean, that's, again, like Augustine, pretty obvious. Um, but then, then he gives some advice on what do I do if a good spirit, if an angel comes and visits me? What do I do if a demon comes and visits me? 
says, well, if it's, an, if it's an angel, rejoice, be glad, <laughs> you know, fear not. <laughs> um, if it's an evil spirit, he says, hate these guys. Treat them with utter contempt. Don't listen to them. Ignore them as much as possible. Don't get into dialogue with them. Um, and don't be afraid. Don't let them intimidate you. He says, you know, the, these demons are really powerless. Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers, having triumphed over them at the cross. And so we have no need to be afraid. And he said, they, they try to project themselves as big and, and, and scary in order to get us to be afraid of them and to do what they say and to be intimidated. But he's saying, you know what? These, these really can't do anything um, to us. The only, even in the Bible, Satan could do nothing to Job without express permission from the Lord. So the devil has no power in of, him, of himself to harm people. He tries to make, make you think he does, um, but he doesn't. And so Antony, he's, he's, how did Antony overcome these demonic visitations? He says, I, I sang the Psalms. <laughs> I went to a worship and praise service in my cell. You know, <laughs> I started giving the Lord. I started raising a hallelujah to the Lord day and night, <laughs> and these things. Uh, and he persisted in it. Um, you know, and it, I think that's just so such good advice too, because I've seen in a lot of charismatic circles, like a demon appears in the room, and people start telling you, like, rebuke it until you're, you know, just keep going, keep going, keep rebuking, da, 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 da. and and people spend a lot of time and energy conversing and commanding the devil. When Antony says, no, my focus is on Jesus, my focus is on the Lord, and I'm going to worship him in the beauty of holiness, and this thing's going to go. Yeah, I'm reminded mm -hmm. of, uh, of the letter of James, where he says, mm -hmm. resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw right, near right, to right. God, and he will draw near to you. Uh, exactly. It's exactly. a bit of instruction in, in spiritual warfare there. And I love the, the balance in Anthony between uh, we don't shy away from evil spirits or demons, but at the same time, we don't overly engage them. Uh, and, and if Absolutely. we do speak to them, we're essentially just speaking the name of Jesus to them, which Absolutely. is that, that the name they can't stand. Right. And that's exactly what Antony tells people to do. Declare the name of Christ. Declare the name of Jesus. Um, you know, Father Ron, you'll appreciate this too. This is very common in, in the Anglican Church to do the sign of the cross. He says they are terrified of the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I love that. <laughs> Just you cross yourself and declare the name of Jesus, and and those things have to go. He has a story of a spirit appearing to him, and he he asks the spirit, "Who are you?" Um, because he wanted to discern if it was a good angel or bad angel. He wasn't trying to get in dialogue, but he was trying to see, like, "Hey, are you from Jesus or not?" And the demon responds, "I am Satan." <laughs> <laughs> way to be way to be uh way to be obvious there that, that's Antony pretty subtle says, exactly. <laughs> exactly and he says you monks are causing me lots of trouble christianity is everywhere and i'm tired of you monks going into the wilderness and getting rid of my territory here in the wilderness it's really intense story but he just said i just declare the name of jesus and it and it vanished um and so i've heard testimonies of people too they have demonic visitations in the night I'll go into sleep paralysis. I've actually had a few experiences of this myself where I'm frozen. I can see these demons actually visibly manifest in front of me. I'll never forget this one experience. Um, and I was, I was stuck and I was trying to get the name of Jesus out and I, and I couldn't do it. I was like paralyzed. Um, finally, I'm struggling and I, find, G -G -G, and I finally get the name of Jesus out and all of them completely disappear. Um, and then I shoot up out of my bed. Um, it was honestly one of those experiences was like, was this a dream or not? I don't know, um, right. but I use the name of Jesus, and these bad guys had to leave. So follow Abba Antony <laughs> and declare the name of Jesus and worship the Lord, Yeah, and they'll puff away like smoke. <laughs> um, so um, so Antony, he, this is why he's telling his monks, um, pray for the gift of discerning of spirits. When the spirit comes to you, don't be afraid. Bravely ask him, who are you and where do you come from? <laughs> he says, again, it's not to get in a dialogue with him, but it's, he says, if it's a good spirit, your fear is going to be transformed to joy. They're going to they're gonna want you to worship Jesus. They try to get you to worship them. It's, it's bad. And if it is a demon, just you asking them that question, their power is weakened because they've been exposed, he says. Um, but then again, focus on the Lord, declare the name of Jesus, and ignore these demons as much as possible. Um, one last experience of Antony, and then we'll close. Um, chapter 82 of his life, Athanasius records this ecstasy um, that Antony experiences and this prophecy of judgment coming to refine the church. 
So he's working one day, and he's with a few friends. He's with a, he's with a church leader named Serapion and a few of his companions, and he goes into an ecstasy. Um, he, he goes into this trance-like state. It says, Antony, quote, groaned a great deal, trembled. He prayed, and bending his knees, he remained that way for a long time. So a trembling, a groaning came on, and he was on his knees, and he, he remained in this still state for a period of time. And then um, it arose from a weeping as he began to tremble. And Antony comes out of this experience, and later they're like, Antony, what happened? What did, what did God say? And Antony, in a, in a trembling, um, said, God said that there is wrath about to come on the church, and it's better that you would, you would not be alive to see it. He said, I saw a vision of these mules violently kicking the house of the Lord. And he heard a voice saying, my altar shall be defiled. Well, um, come to find out, and Athanasius writes this, two years later, Arians come into political power. They start taking over the Nicene churches. Um, again, the Arians are those that are declaring that Jesus, the son, is a creature. Um, whereas the Nicenes are saying, no, he is true God, just as the father is true God. Um, and they take over, and they take over churches and basilicas, and they start defiling the altars. Um, so this really, this really comes true, um, Athanasius writes. But Anthony is also comforted in the vision by a voice by the Lord. It's saying, do not lose heart. God has been angry, but he will heal, and the church will click, quickly revive. And he also says this very clearly. Um, Only do not defile yourselves with the Arians, for that teaching is not from the apostles, but from demons and from their father, the devil. So it's really (laughs) intense. (laughs) So it's just um, ignore. And and why I think that's important, again, a few things going on. He has a physical response to this trance, trembling, groaning, weeping, stuck in this on his knees for some time. He sees a vision and he hears a voice. So all of these things can happen in a trance. In a vision, but it's also what's interesting about this voice is it's it's warning them to stay in line with with biblical orthodoxy, the teaching of the apostles, which is another way to to measure whether something is from God or not. Um, and I think that's probably uh, you know one of the most appropriate contemporary applications from this too, because uh, in our culture today, and it's been this way for a while, we've really separated doctrine from experience. And so the temptation in some circles is to say, well, no, what's important are these experiences, these visions, these dreams, that feeling of closeness, that hunger for divine things. If you have that, then doctrine doesn't really matter. Uh, Some would even go so far as to say that, that, you know, doctrine is for those who don't have these kinds of experiences. But looking back to the fathers, we see again uh, they don't put a rift between those two things. They're both right. important. They're both vital. Right, right. And it's actually the measure of what is true and what is counterfeit. Um, yeah. Had Antony heard a voice that said, um, the Arians are right, I mean, Athanasius <laughs> would not be writing this biography. And what's interesting is Athanasius, who was the the doctrinal bulldog of the 4th century that I mean, he was. This guy was exiled five times by the Roman <laughs> Empire by a Roman imp, by an Arian Roman emperor um, because he would not shut up about Jesus being true God. And he says, "I'm not. I don't care where you send me. I'm going to defend what the apostles taught us." And so Athanasius, this guy, that heavily doctrinal, philosophical, scriptural argument for Jesus Christ as true God, as the Father is true God. He's the very one writing the life of Antony, which records all of these experiences that Antony has. So I think that's very telling, too, that the, the relationship between the two. That seems to be uh, 1 John 4, 1, where beloved test mm-hmm. every spirit, and this is how you'll know a spirit is from God if it witnesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you know, which Jesus Christ coming Absolutely. in the flesh was orthodox theological position of Jesus Absolutely. being fully man. And so it's Absolutely. right there in First John four, John's saying, "This is how you're proper doctrine is going to how you're going to be how you test these things." Exactly. And, exactly. Um, so there's always that connection, and having those things divorced, uh, as as Father right. Ron said, that right. makes it much more difficult to discern what comes from God and what doesn't. Exactly. And I, and one last point on that, you know, for Augustine especially, it was reflecting on theology, reflecting on who God is, and on 
eternal life with God in the saints, reflecting, writing a whole book on the Trinity. It was these things that was very devotionally done for him. And it was in, in, in the instance and in confessions, it's the very thing, it was the discourse and about this, the theology of the resurrection of, <laughs> of the saints that led into this encounter. And so um, just one final point on that, um, on the, yeah. how the two are totally integrated for the fathers. Um, so in summary, what are some lessons we learned from the fathers, especially Augustine and Antony? First of all, visions, dreams, raptures, visitations, they do in fact occur, and for some, quite regularly. Um, not for everyone, but for some. They often occur while people are in prayer, in worship, or asleep. <laughs> it's the only way you can have a dream, <laughs> to be asleep. Um, fasting, prayer, and a life of holiness seem to... Um, Josh, you, Josh Hoffer, you know, I'm, I'm using the language you denounced earlier. To cultivate an environment for no, you said, for but, but you had said it yourself. It, the the environment, I, and what I meant by that is that having a having a group of people that is constantly having dreams right. and visions right, 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 right. doesn't mean you're cultivating an environment. The environment right. you're cultivating is the environment of the heart. You, you yes, absolutely can so. cultivate that environment. Yeah, and that, right, and you right, had said right. that earlier, that interior environment. So, yeah, I would. It's it's not that you've got a bunch of people doing strange things. That means more strange things will happen. That's all I was exactly. trying to say. No, that's good. That's good. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, these experiences also they can produce in us a great love for divine things and a great hatred or discontent with worldly things and sin. Um, they can provide strength in a time of trial and suffering. They can provide wisdom and direction on how to navigate a personal crisis or a church crisis. Um, it also tells us that there's a need for discernment of spirits and how to respond. I just think that's so much wisdom there for Anthony to say, pray for this. If you experience these kinds of things, if you know people that do, if you, if you, if you want to experience these types of things, don't just ask for these, ask for discernment. Ask for discernment of spirits, how to discern whether they're from God, from the flesh, from the devil, um, or and, um, and how to respond to them, how to make sense of them. Um, never worship anything besides God. <laughs> you know, if you ever see something, and Colossians <laughs> talks about this, some have given themselves to visions and the worship of angels, um, yeah. and, and, and at the expense of the truths about who Jesus is and how we are to follow him. So stay doctrinally orthodox, reject Arianism. <laughs> It's from Satan. Um, and don't be afraid of demons. Sing the Psalms. Don't focus on them. You know, figure out what spirit it is. Declare the name of Jesus. Worship the Lord. These things got to go. Don't be afraid of them. Um, so. Um, Excellent. Excellent, Matthew. Excellent. Thank you for uh, what, a, what an awesome, awesome, uh, very helpful insight. Um, I, if we have any questions, Josh, you know, Josh Lewis, um, do we have any questions that we can bring up? Is I noticed that it seemed like if you were reading the comments, it almost felt like a different video was going on talking about oh. masking and COVID guidelines. <laughs> so. <on> lamp. <laughs> <laughs> Away with them. Away with them all. <laughs> so the only the only we'll question that follows the guidelines of actually writing question before the question <laughs> was about COVID. So I think we can move on. Okay. Wow. Okay. No questions about <laughs> visions, dreams, trances. You guys must. Yeah. Yeah. Me got 130 people watching right now. Okay. Well. Yeah. Mm. Well. No. Yeah, there was you, lots of questions about COVID guidelines, but like I said, it's like it was like you were watching a different video if you were looking at the comments. <laughs> Matthew was so thorough; he answered all their questions. That's what it was. Yeah. Every, we 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 all know everything that we need to know now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you wanna if you wanna learn more about Augustine's part that we can't cover, go read On the Care of the Dead. It's really about burying people. Um, but he talks about visions from angels and martyrs and things like that too. So very interesting. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well Very good, very good. Any any final thoughts, Ron? Uh not really. I I, I don't really think I have anything to add to this. I mean, it's, it's very enlightening, um, and, uh, and encouraging. And again, something I always go back to when we, when we're talking about the fathers is how effortlessly they weaved, uh, so many of the things that, 
that these days we're so tempted to divorce from each other. And Augustine, Augustine is known as this, uh, you know, erudite and, and scholarly theologian, which he absolutely was. Uh, but you read his confessions, and when you read the depth of his, his love and, and devotion to God, the language that he used, the language of scripture, the language of the heart, uh, how devout he was, same with Anthony, same with, with, with all of the, the church fathers and the church mothers as well, uh, then it becomes not all that surprising that they experienced these things because they, they lived their life so close to God. God was not some distant uh, philosophy or area of thought, but uh, he truly was the, the highest love in, in their life. So uh, it's, it's an encouragement you know, for, for me anyway, not to pursue the experiences necessarily, but to pursue the God uh, who gives these experiences. Um, and perhaps he will grant them. Very good. Uh, uh, Matt or Ron, any book recommendations on the topic? I just see that Sarah Kokura's commented books. Um, well, I mean, confessions, books. of course. Confessions. You got to read confessions. Yeah. Gotta I think that. we're going to get that. We're going to get that every episode. Yeah. I, exactly. I know. I'm unashamed lover of St. Augustine. Um, um, he's awesome. It's in book nine where this particular experience occurs. And he actually records a, a couple of others throughout. Um, it's, um, but it's a classic. And then The Life of Antony. Um, there's a number of, I mean, you, can, you could probably find it online for free. Um, a lot of these texts you can actually. But um, if you want it in a hard book form, uh, the, the Classics of Western Spirituality has a translation. Um, and then, uh, but a lot of people have translated it. Um, and you had said when we were talking about this uh, and planning the episode that Teresa of Avila has some good insight oh, into yes. uh, the same, right? So what what would you recommend in that in that her vein? life, her her autobiography? It's just called the life of Teresa of Jesus. Um, in fact, I've got the compilation here, um, Volume One: The Collected Works of Saint Teresa of Avila. Um, this includes more than her life, her autobiography, includes a number of other works um, where she she just talks about a lot of these experiences she's had. Um, she gets more into distinguishing different types of visions that one can occur, but her main point is to say, how do I carry my heart in this pursuit of God, in this life of prayer? Um, and, uh, and But she'll give a number of examples of visions and encounters that she's had, um, which are um, which are very interesting, especially the one where she gets rid of a demon by sprinkling holy water on it. That's always a fun one, but, um, <laughs> she, <laughs> but, but she gets more serious. Too. I mean, she's serious the whole time, but, uh, but yeah. I mean, just some powerful experiences um, on that. Um, if you're looking for just a more kind of a history, um, it's that, that includes some texts. Uh, there's, there's this book called Prophecy in Carthage, um, I believe it was a Pentecostal guy that wrote this. It's more, he looks at Passion of Perpetua, the martyr account that I mentioned. He looks at Tertullian of Carthage and Cyprian of Carthage, the guys I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. And he pulls out straight from their text um, where this appears, how they use it, um, and things like that, which I think it's, it's, it's been a really helpful read just as far as where does this occur in, the, in early church and, um, and just kind of his introduction on why he thinks this is useful um, for the church today. And that's helpful. So it's Prophecy in Carthage by Cecil M. Robeck. Junior, prophecy in Carthage. Um, check out your religion library. I'm sure they've got it. There you go. The um, I'll throw out West the, a book uh, by West uh, a guy named Cuthbert Butler. He was a Catholic Ooh. priest, and the book Western Mysticism. He goes through uh, Augustine, Gregory the Great, and um, uh, oh. It starts with a B. Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard of Clairvaux. No, Clairvaux. Yeah, and showing, and part of it he taught. Yeah, Bernard of Clairvaux. Yeah, he talks about, um, in in part, he talks about what they what they thought about when it came to seeing visions, um, and the vision of God as that broader context of what your heart sees and opening the eyes of the heart. So that was a really eye opening read for me, seeing the the uh, uh, 
the thread in Western Christianity uh, about that. So, uh, you know, one of the things I'm thinking as we close, I could see there's a whole bunch of questions that came through, but we're we're getting pretty late now. Um, so we might have to have a, uh, a follow up where we talk about stuff. Um, just thinking about a statement that Therese of Lisieux, a 19th or 19th, 20th century um, mm -hmm. uh, Catholic um, nun, she was talking about these experiences that you have with God <clears throat> and how sometimes for her it felt like divulging the experiences was would be tantamount to cheapening the experience. That there's these things that just happen inside of you that actually, you know, sometimes there's a there's a there's a temptation when we have experiences in God, when we see these visions and things like that, to just go to the nearest mountaintop and hope everybody will listen to us. But you know, mm -hmm. sometimes these moments happen to cultivate something, like, like Matt's been saying, that deep desire and that hunger for the more of God. And, right. and sometimes we're way too quick to share the things that happen to us, rather than letting right. the seed that God's planting work deep in our heart to cultivate that hunger so that atmosphere that inner atmosphere you know that we're cultivating really takes root and that hunger begins to flourish and we really begin to pursue the holiness of god and that that taste of heaven that Aunt, that uh, augustine talks about and and so just in talking about all this stuff just make sure you exercise discernment and wisdom um, as you as you embrace some of these things, because they should be, not, like you said, not everybody is it going to happen, but it is definitely part and parcel to preparing your heart to follow God, and and so we just hope that uh, as you approach these things, we just pray that discernment and wisdom would accompany you as yes. you walk into uh, yes, uh, and and open yourself up as you open yourself up to these things that God could do that that there'd be discernment in there there'd be wisdom in there and and we just pray that the grace of God rests with you and and a passion for his heart increases and thank you everybody so much for tuning in and for listening and we're looking forward to seeing you next week and we're going to um we're going to see whether the punching santa um you know what what that's all about so uh, we'll see you guys <laughs> <laughs> santa's delivering the punch not receiving yeah, that's the punch. right it's yeah. punching areas <laughs> yeah. and so we'll see everybody next week and uh, it's been wonderful being with you guys